Thank you all for joining Darien Library this evening for an exploration of Pippin, the Stephen Schwartz musical with Gil Harrell. Uh, while there are several interesting stories of, about Pippin's 50 year fabled history, Ben Vereen and Bettina Miller won Tony Awards for their portrayals of the leading player in the original Broadway production in 1972 and the 2013 revival, respectively, making them the first actors to win Tonys for Best Leading Actor and Best Leading Actress in a Musical for the same role, which I thought was remarkable. Um, Gil is a musicologist and music theorist whose interests include styles ranging from Western classical repertoire to jazz, Currently, Gill is teaching at Naugatuck Valley Community College, where he was presented with the Merit Award for Exemplary Service to the college. And let me explain why. Currently, Gill conducts the College Chorale, the Acapella Ensemble. He teaches music history and music theory and serves as musical director of theater productions. Outside of teaching, Gil enjoys staying active as a pianist and a vocalist. Before we begin, I would like to mention that programs at Darien Library are made possible by the annual Friends of the Library campaign. We thank you for your support to make programs like this, as well as our collections available to the community. And I'm happy to say that Gil will be back on April 20th. May 11th and June 1st, and he will tell you more about what, what he will be bringing with him. And I hope everyone is ready to visit Broadway now, and I'll turn the mic over to Gil. Thank you so much, Pat, for that introduction. Actually, you alluded to some really interesting aspects about Pippin and its, its long and storied history. And that particular detail is going to be very much in the conversation this evening because we're going to talk about the longevity of this piece, but we're also going to talk about its various incarnations. And obviously, for many of you to hear that uh, that there was a, a Tony Award won for best uh, leading actor and actress for the same role, uh, that's extremely unusual. In fact, it's unprecedented, and it testifies to the fact that Pippin has this really unique identity as a musical that's evolved quite a bit over the last nearly fifty years. So, first and foremost. Uh, let me just say thank you to Pat and to the Darien Library, not only for sponsoring this program, but for the upcoming programs, which will continue our deep dive into the scores of various musical theater uh, classics, I guess you'd say, Broadway blockbusters. And, and Pippin is certainly that. Um, Pippin is a work that was conceived by Stephen Schwartz when he was a student at Carnegie Mellon University. And when it made its way to Broadway, he was in his mid twenties. If you can believe it, uh, he had already uh, been very successful on Broadway with Godspell the previous year. So now he's got really two hit shows in his mid twenties. Uh, by the time uh, that Pippin makes it to the stage within a few years, you've got The Baker's Wife. And then uh, of course, later on in the early nineties, Children of Eden, and then you know probably his best known work, 2003 Wicked. So Stephen Schwartz is someone who's attained tremendous, tremendous success. His accolades speak for themselves. And of course, uh, tonight we're going to be talking about what's probably, I would say, one of his less appreciated shows. And the reason I say that, despite its many accolades and despite the many awards that it's won, it's never won any awards for best score or best musical. The awards have all been focused on the performers. So for example, uh, Pat mentioned Ben Vereen, who played leading player in the 1972 original Broadway version, and uh, Patina Miller, who played the same character in the 2013 revival. We're also going to talk tonight about a, a character, uh, or I should say a historical figure, who deserves a lot of credit in this discussion, and that's, of course, Bob Fosse, who choreographed this behemoth of a show, which is, is um, actually quite intricate when it comes to dance numbers, and, and when the revival was uh, was created and curated and re-choreographed in 2013, much of Fosse's original uh, choreography was preserved and the choreography that was added was added in the style of Bob Fosse uh, done by Chet Walker. So there's uh, elements of the show that have evolved tremendously. There are elements that have been preserved 
And obviously um, there's uh, a very complex plot at the center of this. I think one of the reasons that um, Pippin has never won best musical uh, or anything really associated with the score of the show and really it's focused, the awards have been focused on the actors is uh, because the plot is really quite complex. And this is something that can go over one's head. On the surface, it might seem like this is a, a show that involves, oh, shall we say, uh, harmlessly and cute and naughty themes. Um, but actually, I think if you really look at the libretto and you read the story, there are aspects of the show that, that make it really surreal and, and even very disturbing by the end. And I think most people who watch the show perhaps don't even realize the depth and, and subtext that exists in this show. So we're going to get into all this tonight, and I'm really excited to do so. And obviously, when it comes to talking about a Broadway musical, we want to look at the score, we want to listen to some excerpts. So I've chosen a number of excerpts. Um, we'll have a chance, I think, to listen to four or five this evening, uh, mostly from Act One, but a couple from Act Two as well. Now, I do see in chat, David has asked, uh, what concert am I referring to? David, I'm so glad you asked because this gives me a chance to plug uh, and, and uh, discuss something very relevant, very topical, uh, the musical theater production this semester at the Naugatuck Valley campus is in fact none other than Pippin, the very same musical we're discussing tonight. So uh, for those of you who after this evening are curious and you have your interest in Pippin renewed and you're looking to perhaps watch a full production of this, you can tune in on the 20, 29th and 30th of, uh, of April, just in about what's that, three and a half weeks or so to watch our production of Pippin. And I'm just so happy. I'll be playing keyboard in the pit. Um, uh, there are a number of uh, my students who are regulars at these uh, Darien Library lectures who, um, who will be performing in the cast. And uh, we are one of the few colleges that is currently engaged in putting on full productions, fully staged productions of musicals. Uh, the only difference is obviously we won't have a live audience, but we will be broadcasting live and I'll make that link available when we have it. So thank you, David, for uh, allowing me to segue into that, uh, that particular detail. So let's talk about the show. We'll start as we always do by getting into a discussion of the plot. And then we'll look at the music and we'll see how the music and how the musical storytelling uh, which of course comes to us from the composer Stephen Schwartz, engages the audience and makes the plot come to life and makes the story more compelling. This is of course the, the goal of any composer, right? How do you use music to enhance the, uh, the text, the lyrics, the story, the narrative? In the case of Stephen Schwartz, he is a skilled librettist as well as a skilled composer. So the words here are going to come from Stephen Schwartz, the lyrics, I should say are gonna come from Stephen Schwartz as well. Uh, and he, this is nothing new for, for uh, Stephen Schwartz. In fact, I was on a, a Zoom call with him, uh, not just him, this was part of a seminar, uh, the Broadway Teachers Workshop last summer. And he talked at length about his, his method and his approach to composing. And of course, like any composer who's, um, who's writing music, a lot of it has to come from the text first. And so there's a, a very specific genesis, a specific ontology to how these works come to us. All right. We begin with a story that involves characters with the name, well, obviously Pippin, and names like Charlemagne. And some of you might think, well, you know, I studied history. I remember Charlemagne. It wasn't Charlemagne, the, the Holy Roman Empire Emperor, the first of, of that lot. Wasn't he crowned on Christmas Day in the year 800 and became the the essentially the de facto leader, the reigning ruling figure in all of, of uh, Europe, continental Europe that is, and that is true. However, the story of Pippin in the musical uh, has almost nothing to do with, um, with medieval times or certainly with the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, the names are indicative of a general time period that we're talking about. But actually, the story is filled with anachronisms, and the names are really more coincidental than anything else when you really get down to brass tacks. For example, in the original production, uh, you might have Pippin dressed in the tunic of a, a medieval lord or prince, as is his case, and Charles would be dressed as a medieval king. 
But um, you might have other characters, for example, the character of Fastrada, who we'll discuss a little bit later on, maybe wearing a cocktail dress. And the character of Lewis in one production was wearing a military uniform from the 20th century. So therefore, um, you know, what we're talking about here is really essentially, uh, you know, a story that is riddled with um, anachronism that is not really meant to be uh, set in the medieval period or in medieval times, but is more uh, associated with a general, um, I guess you would say, a vibe or an ambiance, an atmosphere that is conjured up by uh, the names. So the name Pippin, Pippin of Av in fact, was not the son of Char Charlemagne or Charles, uh, the first Carolingian emperor, but rather uh, it was the name of his father, actually Charlemagne, uh, his father's name was Pepin the Short. So I guess he was vertically challenged uh, as we might say today, <laughs> but um, anyway, all right. Let's go ahead and talk about the, um, the characters here. Well, we have Pippin. Pippin is described to us as a young prince who is uh, seeking his fortune in life, seeking his destiny. He's looking for meaning in life, looking for, um, for fulfillment, for satisfaction, for a sense of, of worthiness and, um, and that sort of thing. Therefore, I think you could make the case that in Pippin, there's a sense of oh, uh, existentialism that's woven into this plot. And that's again, something that might go right over one's head, but it's really front and center. When we get to the end of this musical, it's very obvious, I think, um, certainly in the last measures of the musical, that this is a plot that involves a great deal of introspection, reflection, and almost deep philosophy on the order of someone like a Heidegger or some of the, uh, the late 19th or early 20th century German philosophers. Um, therefore, Again, the plot is going to, you know, for us tonight, we want to really get to the bottom of this plot and ask ourselves, you know, what's going on in this story? Things are not as they seem. They're really not. So we have Pippin, we have his father, King Charles. Now, King Charles or Charlemagne is a, a typical military figure. That is to say, uh, he's brusque and short tempered and has a very kind of shall we say, dismissive attitude when it comes to the rights of his people and uh, things like going to war. Charles glorifies war and, and uh, extols the virtue of military combat and, and physical prowess. Uh, so in many ways, Charles represents the sort of overbearing father that can never be pleased, right? He's already king. He rules the kingdom with an iron fist. How can a son like Pippin possibly get his attention and get his um, or, or win his, uh, his favor when Pippin is a more, you know, a quieter, uh, more introspective scholarly type, you see. Uh, Charles is married to Fastrada, it's his second wife. Fastrada has, uh, ha has had another son by, um, or has had a son by Charles. So this is Pippin's stepbrother, Lewis. Lewis is a sort of, uh, kind of a carbon copy, but a dumber version of his stepfather or his, excuse me, his actual father, Charlemagne. Um, we've got Bertha, who's the sort of saucy grandmother of Pippin, who in her act one number sings a, a very uh, compelling uh, exhortation to Pippin to live his life and to, to not wallow in misery and self-doubt, but to simply get out there and live your life. And uh, we've got Catherine, who we meet in act two, who becomes the love interest. But I would suggest that the most interesting character in this musical is the mysterious figure known as leading player. In fact, this is the first Pip, uh, figure to sing and one of the last figures to, to sing. The leading player is introduced to us as the leader of a mysterious performance troupe. Now, what kind of performance troupe is it exactly? Well, we find out a little bit about that in the opening number, which is called Magic To Do. And here's the score. And when we look at this, actually there are some curious things that even if you don't read music, you'll notice. You'll see here it says each bar is out of time, the strings are tuning, the orchestra should sound like they're tuning up, miscellaneous sound. This is a very unusual way for a score to begin. Usually if you're gonna have the band tune up, why would you ever bother to notate such a thing? But that's exactly what we get here. And then this mysterious riff comes in, very uh, evocative of the kind of uh, 
progressive harmonies, or I say rock, progressive rock harmonies of the 1970s when this was written. And the folk company comes out and sings this very mysterious sounding um, minor key melody, which is going to form one of the primary motifs of the musical. This is going to be heard in the beginning, it's going to be heard towards the end, and then it's going to be heard again at the very end. And you can see here in the score, this is the first person we hear sing as the leading player. The leading player first sings, join us. Now you might ask, well, who on earth is the leading player addressing here? Is she, he or she, and again, the role was originally written for a male um, actor. And of course, in the revival, it was reimagined for a female actress. Perhaps he or she is addressing someone on stage, one of the characters in the musical. Uh, but no, in fact, the leading player is actually talking to the audience. Many of you are familiar with this tactic in drama or in film. What do we call it when someone stares right out at the audience or stares into the camera and addresses the audience? We call it breaking the fourth wall. Now, breaking the fourth wall is not something that's unheard of in musical theater or in theater for that matter, but it, it does happen here. And um, as you can see, the text here is, uh, is curious, right? Join us, leave your fields to flower, leave your cheese to sour, come and waste an hour or two. This is a direct allusion to the duration of the musical, which is somewhere between one and two hours. We're gonna to listen to it in a number, uh, in a couple of moments, but I'll just say a few more words about the leading player before we move on. The leading player's character is shrouded in mystery and the fact that he, or I'll say she, because we're gonna really be focusing in our listening tonight on the 2013 revival. The fact that the leading player addresses the audience, breaks the fourth wall, and is the leader of this mysterious performance troupe is very illuminating. It tells us something that's critical to understand if you wanna really understand Pippin, and that is the following. Pippin is a musical where the actors on stage are playing actors. Let me repeat that. Pippin is a musical where the actors are actually actors putting on a show. In other words, leading player, the actress who plays her is playing an actress who is the leader of a mysterious troupe. The one wild card in this somewhat complex and very meta story is Pippin, the character of Pippin himself. What is Pippin? Is Pippin um, one of the many players or, or members of the troupe? Well, when he's introduced, he's des described as such, but he's described as being new to the troupe. So he's new and sort of uninitiated, but stepping into this lead role in the story. Let me repeat it one more time because it's critical to understand this musical. Pippin is a musical where the actors on stage are actually um, members of a performance troupe who are reenacting a story. That's really gonna be critical because when we get to the end of tonight's program, we'll see how this meta aspect of the show develops and really dials up this existentialism that's part of the plot to what I would call an 11. Um, again, this is something that can sail right over your head if you're watching and enjoying the show, uh, but we'll get into it tonight. And I hope it will enhance and understand people's or enhance people's understanding of the show should they choose to, uh, and I think you should, uh, tune in on the 29th or the 30th to watch our production, or certainly if you were to have an opportunity to see this somewhere down the road. Um, it's something that I think is very misunderstood and, and maybe not talked about enough about this musical. It's, it's a musical where the actors are playing actors. And this is very unusual. And again, the term we use sometimes to describe this phenomenon is meta, M-E-T-A. That is to say, a show within a show. Um, this is gonna come to the, uh, to the fore steadily throughout the show. And by the time we get to act two, it becomes more and more pronounced. And by the end of act two, by the end of the show, uh, it is uh, bonking us over the head. And, um, and it gives us a lot to think about when the curtain comes down. So this is a show that eschews or avoids the traditional happy ending and gives us something that is, I think, far more thought provoking, although some might say more confusing and not as fulfilling. That, that's a perfectly reasonable way to react to to watching Pippin. And those of you who have seen the show, I know some of you have seen the 1972 version, perhaps even in the 1970s, and some of you are perhaps more familiar with the 2013 version. Um, they're very different in some ways, and I will just say this. 
before we get there. The 2013 version had an additional um, scene tacked on as an ending with the approval of Stephen Schwartz and even with the blessing of Stephen Schwartz. And uh, it's really, really changes, I think, the fundamental uh, tone and tenor of this show. So this is a show without a happy ending. It's a show that's very meta, that is to say a show within a show. And it's a show that uh, gives us a lot to think about and maybe doesn't offer a lot of, of concrete answers with respect to the fate of the characters. And therefore it can be a frustrating experience for some and some might choose to just focus on the music. But I would suggest that really the music is written in such a way that it, it enhances uh, our uh, appreciation of what's going on. Now that we know a little bit more about the plot, uh, we can really enjoy the music a lot more. And that's gonna start right at the very beginning. So remember I told you that it begins in the score, notated with the orchestra warming up and we said how unusual that is. Well, now it makes a lot more sense, doesn't it? Because even the pit musicians themselves are a pit playing a pit. Uh, in other words, the pit musicians are part of the show. It's just such an unusual way to present a musical. And yet uh, we know that, you know, the, the uh, meta aspect is, is applied to the pit because why else would they be warming up um, as part of the show? Right, if they simply warmed up, they'd be ready. You know, before uh, the house lights come down to start the show, then obviously uh, it would be more of a traditional pit. But here, the house lights come down, and the show starts, and it starts with the pit warming up. It's just a totally unusual way to begin a show. And again, the term we use, and I know I've said it a few times now, but we'll keep coming back to this word. The adjective is meta. M E T A. Let's go ahead and listen to this opening number. It's called Magic To Do. It's sung primarily by leading player, although by, we will hear from many of the other actors or as they're referred to in the score as players. And again, think of them as part of some mysterious troupe. And we don't know much about this troupe, only that they're breaking the fourth wall to address the audience and tell us that they're about to uh, sing us the story of Pippin. Here is Magic To Do. And the recording is from the 2013 Broadway cast. I want to just pause it because I think many of you are probably smiling now. Anyone who's ever attended an orchestral concert, which I would surmise is every single person on this call, is immediately uh, associating these uh, tune up sounds with the the soundscape of, uh, of you know, the, the various instrumental timbres and sound colors that we experience, the scales, the arpeggios, the uh, flutter tongue uh, notes in the winds, all the things we hear when we go and sit down uh, and get there early before a, a musical uh, performance, an orchestral performance specifically. It's a dramatic way to start the musical. Any musical should really start with a bang. Our composers tend to put a lot of stock in those opening numbers, which involve the entire cast, the full company, as we say in musical theater. And this one's no exception. Now, a couple of things in the score. Did you notice that the various characters, whether it was Charlemagne, who we talked about, or his son, that is to say, uh, Pippin's half-brother, Louis or Fastrada, they're all referred to in the score as players, open parentheses, Bertha, open parentheses, Fastrada. Did you notice how the leading player during the instrumental break said, welcome to the show, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, very overtly breaking the fourth wall and making it clear that the uh, audience participation is kind of encouraged in this show. And in fact, there's gonna be a number of moments in the musical where the audience is directly uh, meant to be involved in the performance. This is obviously a consideration that's very hard to uh, fulfill in, in the age of COVID where we're performing this with a, a live stream where we can't interact with our audience. But just to give you one example of this, in Bertha's number, that's the saucy, peppery grandmother, uh, when she sings her big number in act one, in the middle of act one, she encourages the audience to sing along. And her melody that uh, she sings has this sort of infectious, catchy refrain that if you were in the audience, uh, it'd be hard to resist singing along with it, especially when she counts you in several times. So I see our birthday is actually um, on the call right now for us, which is very cool. 
The score, as we talked about earlier, has a lot of those 70s elements that some of you are no doubt uh, hearkening back to. The, um, the slap bass, which we heard in the ending sequence there, uh, some of these harmonies, which are really straight out of the 1970s, the use of the minor ninth chord, for example, uh, some of these drum patterns, the 16th note hi-hat roll at the end. This is a technical way of describing things that I think many people are recognizing. So some very cool stuff there. All right. We're going to go on and we're going to look at the next number because the next number really introduces us to Pippin. We find out that he's come back from the university and he uh, is introduced by the leading player. The leading player says that he was, you know, comes back from the university and he meets up with his family and he makes the promise not to waste his life on, on uh, pursuing the commonplace and ordinary, but rather to pr pursue only the extraordinary to live a life which is, is um, filled with adventure or something that, that has meaning to him. And this is a very famous song. It's probably, I would say, the most famous of the solos in the entire musical. It's called Corner of the Sky, um, sung, uh, of course, in the original version. Some of you may remember uh, that, uh, that the uh, Jonathan Rubenstein, John Rubenstein, as he's known professionally, who's still around, by the way, he's actually played, um, he played Charlemagne in a recent, um, uh, tour, but in the 70s, he was Pippin. He's actually, it, it's very interesting, uh, his life. He, uh, he was born to Arto Rubenstein, the famous concert pianist. So anyway, um, we're going to listen to uh, Matthew James Thomas, who uh, sang it in the 2013 revival. It's a short song, and Stephen Schwartz has kind of talked about this song, uh, some of the lyrics here. It's about sort of finding what fits in life and finding fulfillment and, and meaning and satisfaction, all these things we've talked about. This is gonna be Pippin's mission throughout the show, how to find meaning in life. And Corner of the Sky establishes that, that ethos, that mode, if you will, right from the get-go. So we get magic to do where the leading player introduces us to this performance troupe, which in the 2013 version, they were turned into a sort of a more of a circus troupe. We'll, we'll talk about that momentarily because we're actually going to look at some of the staging um, by Chet Walker and some of the, um, and Diane Paulus and some of the incredible choreography and acrobatics and gymnastics that went into the 2013 revival. So um, let's listen first to Corner of the Sky where Pippin is going to set the tone for the entire show. Um, Pippin's returned from university and he's made a solemn promise not to live a life of the mundane and the ordinary and to be complacent with things that are safe and easy, but to pursue adventure and to find uh, his, his calling, I guess you'd say. Here is Corner of the Sky. Let's go ahead and share screens back to the score. And of course, Corner of the Sky here is a reference to destiny, to providence, to, uh, to fate, finding one's meaning in life. And here it is. It's a, a fairly short song. Now there's a very specific line there that I want you to keep in mind because it's gonna come back at the end of tonight's program. And for me, this is one of the most hair raising moments in the entire show. And the line is, rivers belong where they can ramble, eagles belong where they can fly. And there, there's a, a, a number of very clever lyrics in this song, right? Cats fit on a windowsill. Anybody who has a cat can probably uh, smile and nod along to that one. Children belong, you know, play in the snow, but why do I feel I can't fit in anywhere I go? Um, there's a lot of clever lines here, but the one I want you to remember is rivers belong where they can ramble, eagles belong where they can fly. I see Barbara's asked a question, remember it's convenient to get to it. Sure, let's get to it now. What in the world inspired Schwartz to tell a story uh, set when and where this show is set? Great question, Barbara, and actually I can answer it because he's addressed it. And, and the, the story is, as a student at Carnegie Mellon, he was apparently taking a class in medieval history, and uh, he, I suppose, was reading about Charlemagne and uh, his, his father, Pepin the Short, and decided, hey, uh, I want to write a musical that's set in the Middle Ages. Now, what he's also said about it is that the show completely morphed and evolved and changed into something that doesn't even resemble 
his original conception of the show in his student days. In fact, I believe the quote from him is, there isn't a single lyric or note from my original version of the show that made it into the 1972 version. So it's a great question. Um, and we're gonna talk about some of the more preposterous um, elements in this show, which are deliberately preposterous. And we're going to talk about it because it comes up uh, early in Act One. So Pippin comes on the scene. And remember, it's not Pippin. Um, it's a character, an actor playing Pippin. Again, there's another layer. Remember that word we kept coming back to? It's meta. So Pippin is played by an actor, obviously. But the actor is playing an actor who's, who's uh, playing the role of Pippin. Again, if uh, <laughs> I know that it sounds uh, redundant to go over it, but it's just so important to understanding the trajectory of this plot and this narrative. So how does one uh, ful find fulfillment in life? Where there's a number of avenues one could pursue. And the first one Pippin decides to pursue, he's already tried learning and scholarship at the university, and that sort of uh, didn't work for him. So the next thing he's going to do, he's going to put on a helmet and a chainmail hauberk and uh, arm himself with a sword and other weaponry. He's gonna march off to battle with his father, Charles. Charlemagne is leading his forces against the Visigoths. And because this, uh, this is what Charles lives for, he loves combat and sort of the martial prowess of the military soldier, uh, the military arts, I should say, associated with the soldier. He sings a song early in act one, which is very comical. Uh, it's called War is a Science, where he, he babbles out uh, a stream of text where he's basically strategizing about how they're going to slaughter the Visigoths. So this is something that really I think we need to come back to Bob Fosse and the, the original choreography. You know, Fosse was, was very interested. Some of you who are familiar with, uh, for example, Cabaret, which was also choreographed by Bob Fosse. It's a lot of jazz hands, a lot of motion in the shoulders and in the hips, a lot of, I guess you'd call it sexiness for want of a better description. And uh, what you get in the, the big climactic battle scene in act, which happens early in act one, when Charles is leading his troops, which now include his son Pippin, who's sort of incompetent, by the way, when it comes to fighting. Nonetheless, Pippin is seeking meaning in life. So off to the battlefield he goes. And we get um, this really curious music, which is written in a sleek, jazzy style. And the song is called Glory. And the leading player introduces this battle. And uh, what Bob Fosse does with it is uh, he, working with Stephen Schwartz, created this elaborate battle scene, which would take place over diff two totally different styles of music. One slow and almost pedantic and, and evocative of 1920s jazz with muted horns and, and uh, the kind of um, milk bottle uh, percussion that we would associate with Louis Armstrong and the Hot Five from the 1920s. And then this big vaudeville number where the main battle takes place. Now you might think to yourself, a vaudeville number, vaudeville music to accompany a bloody battle? Uh, this is the dichotomy, I think, that Fosse was going for, that the, there would be such a strange, stark opposition between the carnage and the brutality of medieval combat, which, of course, you, you're not really going to, this isn't Game of Thrones, you're not going to actually have blood spurting out and, and that sort of thing. Instead, they turned it into this acrobatic tour de force, which was dialed up to 11 by Chet Walker and company. Uh, in the 2013 revival, where they literally brought in a troupe of, I think, seven Cirque du Soleil style uh, circus performers who would augment the Broadway cast for these elaborate dance numbers. And these people are able to do unbelievable things that you have to see to believe. I mean, you know, imagine somebody who could walk down a flight of stairs on their hands. Um, imagine somebody going up into what's called a human flag pose, which is where you you know, you, you have the core strength to hold a pole, lift yourself up to a 90 degree angle and hold yourself up like that. Can you imagine something like that? Well, gymnasts can do that. And this particular gymnast we're going to see in just a moment is so nimble, so agile, so facile with this sort of thing that he's able to actually, of all things, go into a human flag position and climb the pole while in human flag. It's just remarkable. So again, the 2013 version of this uh, musical dialed up the visual presentation to 11 with a circus element. And many of you uh, are who are familiar with the cover art, which I'll show you right here. Um, I'll show you in just a moment. You're familiar with the cover art, which shows Pippin uh, with his back to the audience sort of walking or excuse me, with his facing the audience, um, walking through the curtain and kind of stepping into the spotlight. And the, the colors and the, uh, the effects really make it clear that it's a kind of a circus tent. 
So um, this, this song is called Glory. And we're going to be watching, you know, as with um, really any Broadway musical, it's very difficult to find um, a performance that's completely uh, available and unfiltered and in high, high definition. But there are some, some videos here that are from the Broadway version. So we'll watch them. And um, we're going to cut to the dance. We're just going to watch the dance here. We've looked at the score now for a number of a couple of pieces. Now we'll look at this dance for the, the battle scene. In the dance, we start with something called the Manson Trio. Now that's the 1920s jazz I was talking about with the sort of milk bottle percussion and muted trombone and, and trumpet that give it this old sort of Paul Whiteman and his orchestra from the 1920s feeling. Um, and when they get to the end, they have this sort of ta-da moment. The dance here is meant to be sort of a surrealist. And uh, specifically, it's supposed to, of all things, if you can believe this, it's meant to evoke uh, the, the strange insanity that comes with battle and specifically the, the brutality and macabre of violence that's associated with battle. For example, the severing of limbs and all the things we've read about and seen in, in television shows when it comes to medieval combat. And how do you depict that in a musical? I think that's a really good question, isn't it? I mean, you can't show people, you know, it's not a Hollywood production where you're gonna have blood spurting and, and limbs being severed. So what Fosse chose to do is portray it with this really creepy dance. And when I say creepy, it's capital C creepy. Here's Patina Miller uh, accompanied by two of the players. Remember the players are, are members of this mysterious performance troupe under the leadership of the ringleader, the leading player. And this is um, Glory. We're gonna look at Glory and then we're gonna skip all the way to act two. So here is the uh, trio dance, which is known as the Manson Trio. And when asked, why is it called the Manson Trio? A lot of people are confused about this because it says in the score, Manson Trio. Um, the answer is apparently because uh, Charles Manson was in the news back in the days when, when, um, when Bob Fosse and Stephen Schwartz were, were working on this. So sometimes, you know, the principle of Occam's razor suggests that the simplest answer is the correct one. So if many of you heard Manson and thought of Charles Manson, you would be correct. And again, it makes sense because Charles Manson associated with macabre brutality and carnage. So here is Glory from Pippin. It's hard to take your eyes away from that, right? There's something visually arresting about watching these incredible gymnasts and acrobats and circus performers uh, do things that defy the imagination, testing the limits of human dexterity and agility. Uh, but their nimbleness can't be overstated. We saw that in this, uh, this wonderful bootleg clip that we, we have thanks to the miracle of YouTube. Anyway, um, so Pippin tries his hand at finding fulfillment in battle. And of course, what happens? Finds himself running around clueless, uh, eventually holding a severed head. He has a conversation with the severed head in a rather comical a moment in act one. No fulfillment from battle. So what's next? Well, leading player encourages Pippin um, to uh, seek uh, fulfillment in the carnal ways of life. That is to say, through sexual encounters. Pippin is a very... Uh, it's a very adult show in some ways. Remember, it's written in the 70s, so it's coming out of the sort of sex, love, and drugs, and rock and roll in that era. And certainly Stephen Schwartz has been very open about that. In fact, there's a number in Act One, um, which is called With You, which is uh, meant to represent, of all things, if you can imagine, and I'm not exaggerating here, uh, it's meant to represent a sexual orgy. So it's very, very um, explicit in many ways. Pippin is going to try to find satisfaction through, uh, through carnal knowledge of, of uh, the fairer sex. And of course, it does nothing for him when he's asked afterwards. The leading player says, you really know how to frolic, don't you? And he says, I feel vacant, I feel empty. So what's next? He goes to his grandmother, uh, the very saucy Bertha, who encourages him to live life to the fullest and enjoy every moment of it in this number that really breaks the fourth wall and, and has Grandma Bertha, by the way, in this production. She gets on a trapeze, um, just, just you know, dialing up again that circus element that we kept talking about. We get to the end of act one and Pippin is, uh, he's been frustrated by the fact that he feels empty when he pursues these things. Battle has done nothing for him. Sexual uh, escapades have done nothing for him. So what's next? He's going to sort of get on an ideological crusade and with the uh, encouragement from his conniving 
and duplicitous stepmother for Strada, he's going to con uh, contrive to murder his father. He's going to kill Charlemagne because if he kills Charlemagne, Pippin becomes the king. And so in the end of Act One, Pippin does in fact kill Charlemagne, committing the act of patricide, after which we hear this wonderful number called Morning Glow. And at the end of Act One, Pippin is crowned. And well, that's a good way to end Act One. So what now? Does, has being king given Pippin the fulfillment that he sought in life? And I think many of you know where this is going because we haven't gotten to the end of Act Two yet. So of course the answer is no. Act Two begins with Pippin realizing that everything he's tried to do as king has backfired. He hears the petitions of his, of his various uh, subjects and, and uh, nobles and the like. And he says, well, uh, you know, it's, it's not fair to tax the uh, poor, so I'm abolishing taxes. Okay. Then the army comes to us and says, well, without tax money, sir, we won't be able to pay the army. He says, well, I abolish the army. Great. Then the people from the frontier come and say, well, without an army, we have nobody to defend us and we're being, we're being overrun by the barbarians. So Pippin is a complete and utter disaster and a failure as a leader, and he decides to forsake the crown, and he goes on a bender and basically passes out. Uh, but before that, we get one of the, I think, one of the, uh, the most impressive, what I would call a villain number. Uh, this is where the leading player really starts to reveal her true colors as, as something of a villain. And it, the song is called Right Track. We're going to listen to this one, then we're going to skip to the finale. Right Track is such an interesting number. The text here is really difficult to, to puzzle out if you're looking at it for the first time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the score. And um, we're going to analyze it and see if we can come up with, uh, with an explanation of what's going on in this song. Um, someone asks, was glory, was that scene inspired by a real battle in history? Um, I think it just a general medieval combat, which of course we know anyone who's ever studied it, or even if you haven't, you can imagine it was just a very gruesome, grisly, macabre phenomenon, no matter who, which side you were on. Um, in many ways, it was just, uh, you know, for many people know this, but I'll say it anyway, in the Middle Ages, uh, and even into the 17th century, I think most people who died in war died of either disease or starvation associated with, with famines that were caused by marauding armies, sort of gobbling up all of the, the um, available foodstuffs in the countryside, so to speak. Um, so, you know, medieval battle was really horrible. So I think that the battle scene was, was meant to just evoke a, a really standard, gruesome medieval battle, but again, using this very creative choreography and acrobatics to bring it to life. All right, so the song is called Right Track. Let's take a look at the text. We're all the way now in Act Two, and we're in one of the, one of the strangest keys that music can be in. Um, what we would call a, a flat Dorian, which is what it means is that it's it's a minor key, but there's a wrinkle to it. What it's going to sound like to our listeners here tonight, I think what you'll hear is that it sounds mysterious and there's an element of sneakiness. Maybe there's some connivance involved. The leading player here is starting to show her true colors as somebody who's engineering uh, Pippin's fate really and bringing him to eventually what's going to be a disastrous conclusion. So Pippin's just abolished taxes, Pippin's uh, dissolved the army and his kingdom's been overrun and he's turned out to be a disaster. So he turns to leading player and complains and says, nothing I ever do turns out the way I want it to. He sort of seems like a, a petulant child in this. And, and I think there is a degree of petulance that has to be part of Pippin's character. Pippin, remember, is a young person. So think of a teenager who wants whatever they want and they want it right now. And they can't conceive of the, the idea of waiting and being patient. They want everything, immediate satisfaction and gratification. So Pippin turns to the leading player and says, I want what I want and I want it right now. And nothing turns out the way I thought it would. We start in the silky time signature of 12-8, which means it'll sound like 4-4, but with a bit of a shuffle. Almost everything in this number is offbeat. The leading player starts almost taunting Pippin. You look frenzied. You look frazzled. Well, nobody likes being told. That's like, have you ever had someone tell you, oh, you look tired? Well, what are you supposed to say? Thanks. <laughs> I know. Um, anyway, peaked as any alp. This is a really 
clever bit of word painting here. Of course, the Alp peak, this is a different peak, but this is, you know, uh, punning on the word peak, like a, the Alp peak. Flushed and rushed and razzle-dazzle, dry your lips, damp your scalp. Now I can see you're in a rut, you're in disarray. And notice when she says disarray and words like this, there's a ton of syncopation in the melody. The notes are almost never on the strong beat. They're always off the beat. I would say that for the singers and the actors who have to perform this number, that's the trick here. That's the really uh, difficult part about singing in this number is that uh, you've got to have a really, really rock solid sense of rhythm because almost everything is syncopated. And that means that it's accented sort of in the cracks between the strong beats. If you take it easy, trust a while, don't look blue, don't look back, you'll pull through in just a while because you're on the right track. Here the leading player is telling the Pippin, everything that you're doing, you're actually doing it all right. In other words, all the, the lack of fulfillment, all of the, the misery and the uh, frustration and resentment you've experienced, the bitterness, this is all what I've had in mind for you all the entire time. Let's listen to right track. And instead of looking at the score for this one, we're gonna look at another live performance. This one was done uh, on the VIEW program, I think. And uh, you'll see the original actors from the revival. Uh, again, that's Bettina Miller as leading player and Matthew James Thomas as, um, as Pippin. So here's the cover art, which we said was sort of the circus tent with the circus silks and the acrobat on top and Pippin kind of walking out to the audience. So here is right track. Have a listen to this, but look out for a couple of things. One, listen to the lyrics and how uh, manipulative the leading player is in, in getting Pippin to, uh, to adopt and, uh, and line up with all of the dictums and dictates and suggestions and uh, almost coercions that she's foisting upon him. And also look how Pippin is manipulated here and uh, marvel not only at the uh, syncopation in the music, but also this incredible dance break, um, which requires this, the actors to be quite nimble themselves. So the leading player is leading Pippin along exactly as is planned. And this takes us into act two, which I'm gonna skip over the, there is a, a love angle here where Pippin, after he realizes what a disaster he is as, as king, he sort of abdicates, only he doesn't. He just sort of disappears, goes on a bender and winds up uh, drunk and sort of passed out on the side of the road where he's found by Catherine. Now remember, up until now, and I know this is something that's very abstract, but keep in mind, everything we've seen so far is a sort of a circus troupe or a performance troupe presenting the story as scripted, right? Now we meet Catherine, and what we realize is that, remember I said in the beginning of the program, the actor playing Pippin is introduced in the, early in the show as new to the troupe. So the actress playing Catherine meets the new Pippin and finds herself really attracted to him. And that's reciprocated to a large degree. And so we start to see in act two that the actress playing Catherine is accused by a leading player of going off the script. Now this is really bizarre, isn't it? Imagine uh, a musical where one character accuses the other of not following the script. Um, it's again, very inside, very abstract, very esoteric. We use that word once more, very meta. So this brings us to the finale, Pippin, has a, a love affair, a tryst with Catherine, uh, but he, he thinks eventually that maybe, you know, even though he's got tremendous fulfillment with Catherine, maybe this is not what he's meant to do. Maybe he's meant for something else. So he decides to leave. And this takes us to the finale. Pippin goes back to the leading player, almost supplicating, asking the leading player, what's this finale? What, what's in, what do you have in store for me? Am I finally gonna find fulfillment? And this brings us to one of the most abstract finales in all of the canon of musical theater, but I also think one of the most hair-raising, one of the most poignant, one of the most evocative finales. Simply called finale, this is the end of Pippin. Now remember the lyrics I asked you to keep in mind from the very uh, first song that, that Pippin sings. In corner of the sky, what does Pippin sing? Rivers belong where they can ramble, eagles belong where they can fly. It's sort of a symbolic line representing destiny, representing Pippin's quest to find his destiny. And so finally, the leading player says, okay, you wanna know what I've got in store for you? 
here it is. We've all got this very special thing in store for you. And we begin with, of all things, circus music, what they call in the realm of circus music, a screamer. Anybody who's ever been to the circus knows that there's a, a delightful, a spine tingling sense of, of uh, mystery that comes with the circus, right? They come to your town, they set up their tent and it's dark and mysterious inside. And it's like entering a totally different world, a parallel universe of sorts. And then you go in and you get this music that maybe grows and intensifies and speeds up and changes key and gets higher and higher. And then there's a big percussion blast maybe, and then someone gets shot out of a cannon or someone comes out riding an elephant. But that big climactic act happens usually with a big introduction from the orchestra, from the music playing a, a tremendous role here. So we're gonna to skip to the end and I'm gonna show you what this sounds like. Now in the score, we get something that's called the cakewalk. But again, this is what in, in the realm of uh, circus music is called a screamer. So I bet you didn't think you were gonna learn about circus music tonight, but now you all know about the screamer, a very specific type of circus piece, which is used to build anticipation in the audience, building up to that climactic act. So here's the score. And here is that screamer, that cakewalk. Notice how it changes keys. It's gonna get higher and higher and faster and faster. Very, very typical for circus music, uh, which was really, if you're wondering when was circus music, kind of codified, the answer is really in the early 20th century. I, in my preparing my notes for this lecture and preparing the score for Pippin, uh, I did a bit of research into the realm of circus music and fell down something of a rabbit hole. But nonetheless, here is the finale. Let's pause here. We skipped a little bit in the score, but that's fine. Finally, the leading player says, you're the finale. You are the finale, Pippin. Here it is. Pippin, me? Now, now, you will jump from the highest height into the hottest fire. Now, some of you are thinking, well, that took a turn. and absolutely did. Now, Charles, who you remember was stabbed to death at the end of Act One, but because it was just an actor playing Charles, that actor now steps up and says, you're to become part of the fire, Pippin, Fastrada, be engulfed by the fire. Everyone's encouraging Pippin to jump in the fire or the technical term for that would be to self-immolate. Many of us are thinking perhaps of Buddhist monks or of that iconic imagery from Tiananmen Square from that famous protest. Uh, but here Pippin is being asked to jump into the fire. Pippin is incredulous. You want me to jump and burn in fire? The leading player says, well, you, you're extraordinary. You deserve an extraordinary climax. Remember, these are actors encouraged who are part of this performance troupe, encouraging the newcomer to their performance troupe to jump into the fire as the final climax of this performance they're giving. Everyone's encouraging, like the sun blazing in the sky. What you'll notice in the score is dissonant and mysterious chords, and then these sort of polytonal uh, figurations that come in the wings, which are so at odds with the chords that they really have no connection whatsoever. They're meant to be deeply, deeply disturbing. Let's continue listening. Now that's not the end of the, the tune or the musical for that matter, but I wanna to talk to you about what happens next because really to appreciate it, we would have to watch a full staging and we simply don't have time for it because the scene goes on for quite some time. Pippin is asked by the players, by leading players specifically and encouraged by all the other players who have been inhabiting these characters we've seen for the last hour and change to jump in the fire, essentially to commit self-immolation, suicide, as we've said. Pippin is incredulous at this. He can't understand that this is what leading player has been encouraging him and building him towards all along. When the chorus here sings, a cappella, rivers belong, they're of course echoing the words that we heard in the second number in Pippin's first solo. This is your destiny, they're saying to Pippin. Didn't you say these very words yourself? You've been seeking your fortune. You've been seeking adventure. Here it is. It's time to jump in the fire, burn yourself to death. Pippin is horror struck at this. And he says, essentially, 
you know, he comes down right he, he, in the production, he jump, gets on a sort of a trapeze above the fire. You can imagine how hard this is to do on the community theater level with all the acrobatics and the stunts and the, the uh, circus elements and having a big fire, you know, a bonfire on stage. You can only imagine what our, uh, <laughs> Uh, dean of facilities would say if we asked if we could build a, a huge bonfire but nonetheless Pippin climbs down and he rejects the ending in other words Pippin goes off script and they the uh, the players insult them and at this point the leading player says okay that's it kill the lights we don't want no pinks and reds don't give them the flattering lights and get their costumes they take the wig off of Catherine they take Pippin's clothes away so that Pippin is sort of left as this this uh you know, actor who's been kicked out of the troupe and all of his accessories from the troupe have been taken away. Catherine too, they've all been kicked out of the troupe, both of them and Catherine's uh, son, Theo, they've all been kicked out of the troupe. Eventually the leading player even turns to the pit and says, says to the keyboardist, one of my favorite lines in the entire musical, get your damn hands off the keyboard. And the music stops. So you can see the meta element is dialed up to 11 here. The actor is addressing the uh, the pit and telling the pit to stop playing and says, you try singing with no music. That's one of the last things the leading player says. So what we've got is Pippin is an actor who's new to this troupe, who's been asked to tell the story of Pippin, which ends, as we find out, with Pippin supposed to climb on this platform and leap from the highest height into the hottest fire and commit suicide. And Pippin rejects the score, rejects the script, I should say. And um, it's, it's an incredibly abstract and esoteric ending, but it gets even more intense because of what happens at the very end. Pippin decides to walk away from the circus troupe. And, and when he does, we get a cappella singing at the end and Pippin and Catherine sing the music from, uh, that, that we've heard throughout the finale, which we didn't get to. And basically they say, you know, we've been, I've been seeking fulfillment. It was right here all along. So you'd say that's a happy ending, right? He didn't burn to death. He didn't commit self-immolation and he gets the girl. But what comes next really um, puts a, a really a dramatic and remarkable profound wrinkle in the story. Pippin and Catherine kind of go off stage. Remember, they've just sung a cappella because leading player has commanded the uh, pit to, to stop playing. Remember that famous line, get your damn hands off the keyboard. So Pippin and Catherine walk off and they leave Theo. Theo is the young son of Catherine. Remember, remember, it's an actor playing Theo, the character of Theo. He's been kicked out of the troupe as well. And now the music starts up. And what music is it? It's the magic to do music, the music from the very beginning of the show that leading player used to introduce this, the plot. And now the, the singers come back, the, the players come back on stage. And what do they do? They sort of put the, some of the accessories and the clothing that they took from Pippin and Catherine, they dress up young Theo, this young actor who's, who's um, playing the role of Theo in this, the, this garb, uh, suggesting that he's gonna be the new Pippin. And that's how the show ends. The clothes, the curtain comes down on Theo, uh, sort of up in, in, the, uh, in the rafters of the circus, so to speak, getting ready to make his, his big debut as the new Pippin. And that it comes back to some of that philosophy I talked about earlier with the existential crisis that the plot implies. It's really a very, very unusual way to end the show. And I think a lot of people would be left scratching their head, but not us. Not the, uh, the brave, intrepid few who are with us this evening, because now you understand how this show is structured and what to look for and how the ending really functions and what it's supposed to represent. It's supposed to represent a circle, right? That young people, I think, are dreaming of, of fulfillment, but sometimes they don't have the patience for it. And um, then they realize eventually it was right under their nose. And so uh, now it's, it's then the baton is passed to the next generation of youngsters who are similarly impatient and similarly seeking fortune and seeking their, their destiny, their fate, seeking that fulfillment and that meaning in life, which they don't have the patience to wait for until they too eventually find it perhaps where they least expected it. So there's a kind of a cycle of souls, I guess you might say, that's implied, I think, in the, the persona of Pippin. And that's not something that's immediately obvious uh, when you're first experiencing the show. But I think uh, hopefully after tonight, it, it will be obvious. So with that, Pat, I think I'll turn it over for any questions. I want to thank everybody for, for uh, being a part of this Pippin journey. And I hope they'll join us on April 29th and 30th. And I'm going to make sure to furnish our wonderful community members with that link. 
uh, so that they can um, they can watch it. I'll have the link for them for our next program. I'll put it in the chat on April twentieth. Terrific. Yeah. This has been so illuminating, Gil. Oh, thank you. I don't. I think because you were answering questions during. I don't think we have any outstanding, but I hope we'll see everyone on April 20th when you'll be sharing Sweeney Todd with us. Yeah, that's right. You know, I know some people who are big Broadway fans are probably wondering, well, I love Stephen Schwartz, but I love, I want to hear some Sondheim. So Sweeney Todd um, talking about gruesome and grisly and macabre. I think probably many people are familiar with it because of the, um, the film adaptation um, from oh, 15 years ago almost with Johnny Depp in the role. And, and I want to say this because I, I didn't have many flattering things to say about Russell Crowe as Javert last summer when we did our Les Mis program. <laughs> say Johnny Depp does a very admirable job in the role of Benjamin Barker slash Sweeney Todd. Barbara says, uh, talk about Assassins. Assassins, great show. Another Sondheim masterpiece. Barbara, we'll, uh, we'll add that to the list of, uh, of desiderati. Uh, that is to say, shows that uh, that perhaps we'll delve into in the coming coming weeks and months. And we couldn't do it, of course, Pat, without the the sponsorship and the generosity of the patrons of the Darien Library, the friends of the Darien Library. And if I can just uh, pay a little compliment here to the excellent programming committee uh, that okay. that chooses such dynamic presenters to uh, to intellectually stimulate the very intellectually curious uh, folks who are part of this family here. Thank you so much, Gil. We'll my see pleasure. you on the 20th. Absolutely. Take care, my friends. Until then. You too.